you may have noticed, uh, if, you, if, if, if you got the, the email during the week or if you uh, look underneath the chairs under every other chair right now, because uh, we didn't know how many people would be here this morning, but there's a Bible. Uh, there's a study Bible, and it's the Christian Standard, which is the, the Bible I've been preaching from since uh, uh, Thrive started. But we want to give everyone that will read it, everyone, a, a Bible. Um, and, and not one of those that has, you know, like a two and a half font where only people that are under the age of eight can still read it, but, but something that can, can be used. Um, and, and if you're wondering, well, well, why? Well, for one, there's unity that happens when we're all together studying the same portion of God's Word, even from the same translation uh, of God's Word. But if we're going to be a church that is about disciples who make disciples and churches who plant churches, it seems wise for us to, to work through this together. And uh, uh, even in the preaching, uh, we're going to talk a little more about Bible study principles and those sorts of things as, as we go forward. Ultimately, we're people that believe that God's Word changes lives. And worst case scenario is we give someone a Bible. So if you say, um, well, is it one per family? No, it's one per reader. If, if you're there and there's not a Bible around, um, I think Michael uh, can, can help. We can get you one. Um, or there, because we just scattered Bibles all over the place. And we hope to, that this will be the kind of the new pattern going forward that that will continue to equip people with Bibles. Um, as we read Scripture, we learn to see Jesus more clearly. If we see Him more clearly, we can follow more closely. If we follow more closely, we can learn to trust Him more deeply. And if we trust Him more deeply, we'll learn to love more intensely. And if we love more intensely, we'll imitate more precisely. And if we imitate more precisely, we'll bear more fruit. Rinse and repeat. And it just keeps going. So I just encourage you. But here's, here's, here's the caveat. Um, they all look the exact same. Write your name in it. Because we get home and I've got one that says Bill inside, but I'm not giving it back. I'm just telling you. I'm keeping it. As a disciple, uh, someone who, who, who does want to follow Christ, um, I have to admit, though, I, I have a hard time staying on track. Imagine I'm not the only one. I have a hard time. I, I, I start off with good intentions, uh, but I get sidetracked. I start off with good intentions that I want to study my Bible, and I, I get sidetracked. I start off with good intentions that I want to train my, my kids to, to grow and to know the, the Lord, and I, I get sidetracked. Um, and I, I mess it up. Today's sermon, today as we get into the text, we're, 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 we're going to look at how Jesus went about his uh, life, his, his, his ministry, and we're going to pick out a few things that, that I think are really crucial. Uh, so if you have your Bible, and I know you do, <laughs> open it to Mark chapter 1. Um, also, if you're, if you're new around your New Testament, it's, here's the other easy part. It's page 1560. Page 1560. Mark chapter 1. Before we get started, can, can, can we pray? Uh, Father, the, the, you know that the idea behind this is that we would put your word into more people's hands. And the more that we get into your word, the clearer we see you, and the better disciples we'll be. So would you... Would you help us with that? We ask that you bless these efforts. We ask, um, God, that even now that you'd tune out the rest of the world for just a bit, you'd help us to focus. Would you wash us of the, the sin and the, the, all the busyness that keeps us from focusing on your word? And would you help us to hear your word and to see your son clearer and clearer today so that we might be the people that you'd have us to be uh, throughout the week. Christ Jesus' name, for his sake and his glory. Amen. 
last week, um, last week as we got into the text, we've been in Mark chapter one, we're just working through the book of Mark right now. Uh, we saw that Jesus was in this little fishing village called uh, Capernaum, right? He went into the synagogue and, and he taught, and when he taught, uh, people were, I mean, they were confused because they never heard people teach with authority like that. Re re remember that uh, you, typically if you were to, to go into teach there, you would say, hey, you know, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and you, you'd stand on the authority of someone else, but Jesus didn't have to do that. So Jesus stood up and he just spoke like, hey, when I wrote this, this is what I meant. And people said, we've never heard anything like that. And then he had this, this strange encounter with a, with, with, with a demon where, where Jesus just says, hey, I've had enough of you. Be quiet. You're not welcome. Leave. And then there's these healings. So we're going to step into this later that night or technically the, the, the next morning. It's likely that Jesus stayed at Peter's house. Remember, we, we, we know that Jesus made this his home base, so it's likely that, that he stayed there. Um, remember, their, their little homes, you had a, a, a simple, simple uh, oh, entry room here, and that's where they'd cook, and you'd bring your animals in at night, and then you'd sleep upstairs or on the roof, depending on what kind of house you had. And so we're stepping into that upstairs or roof where Jesus and Peter and Andrew and honestly probably the entire family, because remember, they didn't have multiple rooms. They're all sleeping in one room here. Mark 1, verse 35. Very early the next morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and he made his way out to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him. Uh, let, let, let's just stop right there. This previous day had been a really big day in the early ministry of, of, of Jesus. Um, I think he had just got started in his, his public ministry, and it was a big hit. Everyone wants to be close to him at this point. Everyone is flocking in from this little town and around. Um, and honestly, can you blame him? If you've ever watched a family member suffer, you ever seen someone in the later stages of something that can't be cured? I mean, you know, it's hard, isn't it? And, and you, you, if, if you were in town and here comes this young preacher that seems to be able to do something that no one else can do, what you're gonna do is by any means possible get your loved one to him. Because maybe there's a chance Maybe he'll notice. Maybe he can do what the doctors can't. So you can understand why everyone was crowding in at their house. And honestly, it had to be a big day for the disciples too. Remember, there's, there's just a, a few of them at this point, And they had walked away from their jobs. And now they had to be thinking, that was a good call, right? This job's got benefits we didn't expect. They're feeling pretty good about what's happened. They have no idea what's yet to come. But Jesus doesn't sleep for a very, very different reason. The text says very early, while, while it was still dark. Uh, the study notes here, here in, the, in the text, they mention that there's, there's an odd construction here. There's three verbs back to back to back. He got up, he went out, he made his way. In other words, what, what they're trying to say is there's intentionality to where Jesus wakes up, says, I've got to get out of here. And you can see him kind of stepping over, folks. No. Trying to get out, trying to, to, to get away. You see, the crowds, they didn't see the exorcism and the healings in the same light that he saw them. Jesus is, is making an impact on the kingdom of Satan at this point. He's, he's attacking the darkness. Light has come. But if you're on the other side of this, you, you just see someone that could heal. And so he realizes he needs to get away, and he needs time with the Father. So he heads out. And the text says he heads to a deserted place. Um, a deserted place is it's also translated wilderness, 
Remember Dan preached on this just a few weeks ago about the wilderness, this place um, that is simultaneously the most dangerous place you can be and the safest place you can be. It's where Israel had to learn to trust God. The wilderness, as you read your New Testament, is a place of repentance. It's a place of restoration. It's a place of uh, 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 fellowship. It's a place of healing. The, the wilderness is where you go if you've got to do business with God. And Jesus says, I've, I'm heading out. And he heads out to do business. It's, it's, it's a matter of fact, this is where he went directly after his baptism. Remember his baptism, it says, and then he went to the wilderness. And it's a funny little thing in the Greek there, in the original language. It says the Holy Spirit threw him out into the wilderness. Literally, that's how the text reads. Like it just says, here we're going. And you head out there. From a larger Bible standpoint, Adam, remember Adam, Genesis? Uh, even if you haven't been around, uh, uh, you, you know this story. Adam failed in the garden and was driven into the wilderness. Jesus won in the wilderness so that you and I could be in a garden. You see, and here you see him heading out to the wilderness in the dark. He, he knew that he needed time alone with his father again. He needed time in prayer and communion one-on-one. -on -one. And the funny thing about the, the Bible here, Mark is different in the way that uh, Mark reads. So John, if, when, when it comes to Jesus' prayers, if you read the book of John, you'll see that he records lengthy prayers of Jesus. Like John 17 is all just this long prayer of Jesus. Luke uh, mentions Jesus praying nine times. He wants to show that Jesus does this often. Now, Mark only talks about Jesus praying in three different occasions. Here, and uh, after the feeding of the 5,000, before he walks on the water, so right then, and then he's praying in Gethsemane. In all three cases, there's a, a demonstration of his power, and there's either expressed or implied conflict to his ministry. And if Gethsemane is a clue, Jesus is heading out to the wilderness because he needs direction from his father. He wants to talk to him again. In other words, when life got chaotic and when things got hard, Jesus intentionally got alone with God the Father. When things got messy or when he realized he was getting pulled off course, the first thing he did was said, I, I got to get alone with God the Father. And he walked away and got alone. And this is a two-way street for Jesus if you pay attention to the text. He, he doesn't head outward to, to love or to preach or to help uh, without first anchoring himself in who God the Father is and, and what the God, God the Father has for him as far as a mission. But the way that flips around is, is as he gets anchored into who God is and what God has for him, it drives him to head out to love people and to preach and to announce the kingdom. For us... Staying on course as a disciple, it requires communion with God. You see, Jesus is more than an example, but he's not less than an example. He, he, he's more than, than just the pattern that we follow, but he also is the pattern that we follow. He's both our Savior and our pattern. As, as followers of Jesus, remember, we're, we're doing his ministry now, his ministry to the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of the world. And you and I, we can't hope to stay on course as disciples if we're not spending time with God to recharge and to realign. There's just no way around that. Even the most efficient car needs fuel, or I guess that's not a good illustration anymore, or electricity, whatever flavor that is. Either way, you need, you need to be reconnected to the power source. I'm not talking about going to church and signing up for more stuff here, although worshiping together, fellowshipping together, being around people, that's super important. 
What I'm talking about is us as individuals, as disciples, getting alone with God the Father. Getting alone, hearing what he has to say. As a matter of fact, I'm going to step on toes. Oftentimes when we do this, what we're really doing is presenting our laundry list of things we want God to do. Here, God, I need you to do this, and I need you to do this. And then we throw this tagline off, and we'll give you the glory as long as you do exactly what I've just said. See, maybe it's more important that we be quiet and just listen to what he has to say. Hence the Bibles. Maybe it's more important for us to, to, to learn to come along say and say, uh, 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 to hear what he has to say and say, your will be done, not mine. If you and I are always going or even always serving and helping others, what we'll do is eventually you run out of gas. And oftentimes we'll find out that we're a long way off course. We're a long way from where we started or where we intended. A long time ago, about a thousand years ago, there was a preacher by the name of Bernard, uh, St. Bernard. We named a big dog after him. And uh, uh, Bernard lived in, uh, he founded a, 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 an abbey in Clairvaux, France, so we very originally call him Bernard of Clairvaux. He wrote this, the man who is wise will see his life more like a reservoir than a canal. The canal simultaneously pours out what it receives. The reservoir retains the water till it's filled, then discharges the overflow without loss to itself. Today, there are many in the church who act like canals, and the reservoirs are far too rare. You too, listen to him say this, you too must learn to await his fullness before pouring out your gifts. Don't try to be more generous than God. As I think about this, I think I don't want to be a canal, and I tend to naturally do that. Where you're just going all the time and you're just giving out rather than being a reservoir, growing deep and growing wide. And think about it, as a reservoir gets deeper, it grows wider and it serves more. Man, that's solid advice. And honestly, it's exemplified by Jesus. When I'm running on fumes, when I'm running on fumes, I become more susceptible to temptation um, more susceptible to anger, depression, uh, you know, just frustration with life. I realized a while back that I need regular time alone with God to hear what he has to say and to pray. I, I, I need that. I'm too busy not to do that. And I used to think that this had to be done in some sort of extended quiet time early in the morning. Uh, I'm a morning guy, so I, I thought that, you know, honestly, I kind of turned it into a new law. If you want to be a real Christian, if you want to be a good Christian, this is exactly what you'll do. Um, like I said, I've, I've realized I didn't know nearly as much as what I thought I did a few years back. I remember trying to encourage my wife when the kids were little. <laughs> My wife, her, her job before she came to, to help me in ministry, she oversaw the budget for three hospitals. And, and here's this woman who's overseeing the budget for three large hospitals, raising two little kids. And here I am being the good husband, encouraging her, if you want to really want to grow as a disciple, sweetheart, you'll get up earlier. <laughs> you can get up earlier and come and sit by me and read your Bible. And I'll wax eloquent about random Greek verbs or something. I look back on that and I go, what an idiot. <laughs> I mention that to say this. Getting alone with God looks different for different folks. And in different seasons, it looks different. You know, for, 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 for some uh, young mom who's running 100 miles an hour, it may be praying for sanity in the bathroom. Maybe your time in the car. We just turn off the radio and go, God, I, I need help. The two key ingredients are, are hearing from him, his word, 
in being quiet and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us and responding back. Remember, a, co- a relationship is always two-way communication. Think about any marriage. If it's only one-way communication, it never works. So if it's just the husband saying, hey, this is what I want, and this is what I want, and this is what I want, and this is what I want, that's not a relationship. Our relationship with God the Father requires that sort of communication as well. And these days, um, I'll be honest, mine looks different these days. I, I like to get up, I, um, I, I read Scripture on my phone in the early, and, and then I run. Um, for me, I like to go out and run, and, and the, I live close to the golf course over here, so I go out and run the golf course when it's dark. Uh, there are no street lights, no house lights, it's dark, and I can go out and be alone. Sometimes I'm praying that God gets me home without dying, but other times I, I can just run and just say, God, I, I'm boogering this thing up. Can you help me? Show me. Show me what's off. All this to say is be intentional in whatever way that you can about getting alone with God on a regular basis. Life, life pulls us in so many different directions. So much to do. So many things to accomplish. So many things to experience. It has only God, only time alone with God has the capacity to, to recenter us, to show us what's most important, and to realign us to the mission that He has for us. In a larger sense, this is what that, that whole idea of the Sabbath is about. In a larger sense, this is what uh, God meant because in that Sabbath, in that resting, it's where we learn to trust and it's where we realign to who he is. It's where we stop and see what's important. It's kind of God's built-in system of resistance against the fear and coercion and multitasking that the world says you have to do. Slow down. Hear from God. Allow him to, to, to reconnect and to readjust. And a lot of times, just to remind you, hey, I love you. Just, just to hear that, because that's who he is. And you, I, I get it, you go, uh, I, I don't have much time. Um, we all have 24 hours in a day. And we'll all only ever have 24 hours in a day. Start where you can. Uh, I've got a kid that lives on the other side of the country uh, right now in the military. And sometimes it'll be, um, you know, he'll call and, hey, I'm heading out in the field. Be back in a, a, a week or two, you know. And I find that as a dad, I immediately want to try to encourage and recenter him to where's that. Hey, man, I'm proud of you. You got this. Go get it. Go do what you are. Never forget who you are, right? Um, uh, uh, um, don't forget who you are. You be the best Marine. You be the best Christian that you can be when you're out there. And I think, daggone, if I'm an average dad at best, and I do that, How much more God, who's a perfect dad, knows exactly what you need, is able to speak into your life and to remind you what you need, to to tell you how much you're loved, and you and I are so quick to, to ignore that conversation. But we need that conversation over and over and over again. But then verse 36 happens. Peter, he's out here, he's leading the search team for Jesus. Honestly, um, and I hate to be the Greek nerd this week, but um, searched is a little anemic. Uh, pursued, hunted is a better word. Like, he's leading this, this team, you know, this, this, this recon team. We got to go figure out where Jesus is, and they're searching high and low because if Jesus messes this up, we got a problem. They want to make sure that Jesus doesn't mess up what went so good yesterday. So they go looking for him. And searching here 
carries the idea of determining and controlling Jesus' agenda rather than seeking and following. Peter is starting, even here in this early chapter one, he's starting to pick up or start a pattern that you'll see throughout all his ministry. Bless his heart. Uh, Peter's always the one who's up front. And, yeah, I'm your man. Here, I got my knife, Jesus. And he's usually the one who's missing the point. And that is such an encouragement for me because I'm worse. I do the same daggone thing. And we have to be willing to allow, allow Jesus to re, readjust that. Look at verse 37. When they said to him, hey, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. And he went into all Galilee, preaching into their synagogues and driving out demons. Here's how I picture this whole thing going down. Here's Peter. Hey, Jesus, man, we've been looking everywhere for you. Everyone is, is, is excited about what you're doing. You're a hit right now. I told my mother-in-law, because she said I was crazy for following you, you know, what she know. But I told her, and, and now this is awesome, so we got to go back and get this on again today. We're going to heal some more people. I've got your rest of your day lined up. And Jesus says, great, let's leave. And Peter says, Hear the crickets? <laughs> if, as, as you read Mark, you'll notice the crowds are never a good thing in, in Mark. They are. Jesus is always trying to get away from the crowds so that he can go and get with individuals, so he can sit across the table, so he can look and, and to chat. He's always trying to get, you know, he'll preach and make announcements in the big setting, but he's always trying to get alone because ministry happens alone. Lives change in conversations alone. That's funny. It, it, it strikes me because every time I go to a church conference or around on my group of ministers, someone always says, hey, how many people go to your church? And I think, I think we're still missing the boat. I've yet to hear someone say, how many disciple makers are at your church? How many people are actually loving their neighbors? Oh, because those are metrics that are hard to quantify, aren't they? How many people are actually taking the time to get to know the folks around them and love them in ways, inviting them into their homes, to talk to them? Oh, back to the text, lest I get on my soapbox. Jesus and his young group of disciples leave so that he can preach and make disciples and dispel darkness down the road. You see, staying a course as a disciple requires making hard choices. Staying the course as a disciple requires making hard choices. Man, if COVID taught us anything, it taught us that our schedules aren't nearly as important as what we thought they were. They're just not. When the world shut down, what was important came to the top. And we realized how much we were missing that interaction. Those are the things that count. And Scripture is pretty clear about this. This would be hard to argue against that you and I, as followers of Jesus, are called to love and to make disciples. That's what we're called to do. And we, we misuse Scripture when we use Paul's verse about all things to all people to mean that I have to be everything to everyone or that you have to be everything to everyone all the time. Or where's that one verse? I, I thought about it and I couldn't find it. That one that says, if we're going to be good Christians, we have to be involved in 25 different Bible studies and serve on 27 different committees and do this and do that and fill our time being busy. Here's why I can't find it. It's not in your Bible. And I hate to admit this, but as a church in the past, we have defined faithfulness by how involved we were. Jesus 
demonstrates faithfulness by getting alone with his father and then by getting about his mission. And if we're following him, that needs to be our pattern as well. I'm learning, and I'm a slow learner. I'm learning to get more comfortable with saying no. For me as an individual, and for ministry of the church, because we could start 10,000 different ministries and 10,000 different ways to move Christians around from one church to the next. But the reality is that you and I are called to love. We're called to love our neighbors and to go serve them. That's what, it, that's what we're going to be about. <laughs> I remember hearing a preacher say this uh, a, a while back, and he said, Unless Jesus walked out of town backwards, he intentionally turned his back on some ministry opportunities. Let that sink in. Because I'm one of those that, if, see, no, we got to be involved. We have to get involved here. Jesus, unless he walked out of town backwards, he turned his back on some things so that he could do the one thing that he had to do. You and I have to learn to be realistic about aligning our lives to the mission that God has given us, to the ministry that God has given us. And this doesn't matter if you're single or married, uh, young or old. Who are the folks in your sphere of influence that you can love? Particularly those who don't know Jesus as Lord. Who can we go and demonstrate and give a visual expression of what it looks like. And then when those times arise, you know, because sooner or later they always do, when sickness hits or when uh, a trouble hits or marriage struggles hit, those who have lived consistent lives in front of them, folks come and ask, don't they? Hey man, I got to tell you about what's going on at home. Oh, and then we have the opportunity to love and to offer something that the world doesn't know anything about. But it requires that you and I constantly have communion with God because we need to be reminded that that's our task and we have to be willing to make hard choices about what we're going to be about and our patterns of ministry. As I, as I see just a couple little verses here in the text, I always picture Jesus getting up early, picking his way across the floor, stepping over Peter. He's snoring real loud. I just, I got to pick on Peter for some reason. And making his way out to the wilderness to be alone because none of them know it but the, other than Jesus, but the cross is already on the horizon. Where he's heading is already set in stone. As a matter of fact, Luke will say a little later that he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. This is what he was going to be about. Ultimately, Jesus head out into the darkness because the Father sent him to provide rescue for sinners and sufferers for the likes of you and me. Those who've struggled to stay on task, those who have struggled to do it right. And if we're honest, those, we, we, we've made the wrong choices intentionally at times, haven't we? Jesus stepped out into the darkness with us in mind. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. So Jesus is going about this so that he could provide rescue for the likes of us. What a gift. If we're followers of Christ, we follow his pattern. And here in these short verses, we see it pretty simple. Get alone with the Father. Let's cut out the noise for just a bit and hear what he has to say. Allow him to do that work of reminding you of how much he loves you. Because there's a world that's screaming that you're not good enough. And here's God saying, yeah, my son is, and I gave him to you. 
And let's be willing to make the choices that keep us on the task that he's given us. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm always amazed at how incredible your word is. Today, would you, would you teach us to be people who don't just come with our laundry list and treat you like some kind of divine bellboy? Would you help us to listen to what you have to say and be willing to make the choices in life so that we can stay on the task you've given us? Christ's name, for his glory, amen.